Okay, up next we have our extension entomologist, Dr. Stormy Sparks. He will be giving a presentation on insecticides to manage white fly and white fly transmitted viruses. So, Dr. Sparks, take it away, sir. Thank you, sir. All right, we'll jump right into it. Try to get us back on time. We're a little bit ahead. Uh, I want to start out by just talking about white fly pressure last year. Uh, it was severe in some areas, particularly in Tifton, where we do most of our work. We had some very high populations. If you look there, that gold line is 2022. This is some trap lines that we've been, uh, Philip Roberts and, and uh, that group have been running for a number of years. Uh, I was actually surprised it wasn't higher than that. When we started back here in July and it would turn hot and dry, I really expected it to explode much worse than it did. And I really think that's a, a tribute to, to our overall management of white fly. We still have severe problems with white fly, uh, but I think our overall management, vegetables, cotton, the, the entire system is, is much better than it used to be. An example there that I showed this morning. Uh, this is Philip Roberts' estimates of how much white fly were sprayed in cotton this year. And you can see in those areas where we have our greatest pressure, that Tiff County, Colquitt County area, uh, well over 50% of the acreage of cotton was sprayed this year for white flies, which is, which is not normal for, for a cotton production. So they're doing a better job managing it there. Our uh, virus was actually, I think, a lot lower than, than I expected as well. When the white flies exploded, you typically expect to see virus explode shortly after that. It did there on station where we were, but in most of our grower fields, it wasn't nearly as bad as, as it could have been. Uh, this is a test I've been doing annually for, I don't know, 15 years, looking at the systemic insecticides and how long they last. We had some severe problems with resistance back in about, what, David, about 07. Uh, the, the neonicotinoids didn't last a week. And we've been doing this for a number of years. This is direct seeded. Uh, drench those plots the day after plant, the day of or the day after seeding, and then look at how long it takes for, for silver leaf to show up. And in this slide here, if you look at all right, these numbers right through here, that's about 22 days after planting, which the last, I'd say, three years is about when everything's broke. We got a little bit longer than that this last year, another four or five days. Uh, before we had severe silvering. Some of that's pressure related, uh, but we're getting as good, if not a little bit longer last year, control out of those. These are all, if you look along there, you've got Admire Pro, which is the orange line there. That one actually, in the last three years, has shown nothing compared to the check. We got some suppression this year, but not as long as the others. You've got Venom, Savano Prime, Corrigin, and Veramark in there all lasting a little over about three weeks, uh, which is a little bit longer than we've been getting, but that's good, good news, and we are maintaining susceptibility in our population. When these came out, they were given four to six weeks. That just doesn't happen. Uh, that three weeks is pretty good as far as managing silver leaf in squash. That tells you you're getting excellent control of white flies because silver leaf shows up at extremely low populations in, the, in yellow squash. That's why I've always done this in yellow squash. Now that other graph right there is the same test. That is virus incidents, virus symptomatic plants in those plots. And you see that there are no differences in those lines. Stanley's not in here. He always complains you can't see differences in my lines. Again, that's the point. There is no difference. It didn't matter what we put out there. With these systemic insecticides, you are not suppressing virus. They have plant, the white flies have to come in and feed, pick up the insecticide in order to die. And by the time they've picked up enough for it to kill them, they've already transmitted the virus. So uh, we've known this for a number of years. You're really not suppressing. You suppress white flies, but you're not suppressing virus with the systemic insecticides. Foliar applications. Uh, and well, and this just shows those at, at drench applications, those back you can't see those two rows there. You can see a, that's an admire plot, that's a check plot, everything else are the plots that are working. We can control white flies with those insecticides in furrow. We're not controlling virus. As far as foliar applications, we've uh, looked at a variety of things. I have seen foliar applications suppress virus once 
I know it can happen, but I've only seen it once. We've all, I've always assumed there's probably a situation where white fly pressure is low, virus titer is low, and we might be able to, to utilize insecticides to suppress virus. You can find it in the literature where specific insecticides are suppressing virus in specific situations. It's always low pest pressure situations. So what we tried to look at uh, the last three years, and this is some work that's been done in cooperation with Clarence Coated, is a, a doctoral student uh, under Do Bob Kimmerite and, and Babesh Dutta. Uh, we're looking at use of insecticides to manage white flies in the fall and seeing if that is also impacting virus incidence. And the way we've done this, if you look in, uh, we've had eight planting dates, two of those years, one of the years we had 10 planting dates. We're going into planting once a week. We're starting before we have white fly problems, carrying it into where white fly problems are severe. So hopefully we can find, if there exists an area in there where pressure's there but it's low and we're impacting virus. And that's, that's the idea of this whole thing. We've looked at Verimark as the drench in most cases. We've looked at PQZ. Uh, because it impacts feeding, hopefully, and that's one that's been reported to possibly impact uh, virus transmission because it impacts feeding, it stops feeding very rapidly. And the last two years we've had Savanto Prime in there because it's one of our best insecticides for adult white flies. So we're killing them before they, hopefully before they, they get in. The first year we did this with Savanto Prime, we sprayed once a week. Last year we sprayed twice a week just to see if we could impact virus transmission. Long story short, there's a lot of information on here, but in each of these, the 2020 is the top graphs, the 2021 is the middle, and 2022 is the bottom. And what you really want to look at is the fact that in, you can see separation in some of these graphs. And what you've got there is the check and the vera mark is not reducing white fly adults. Again, the, that's just the vera mark alone. Where you come in with the foliar applications, this thing keeps disappearing on me, the, like in the bottom graph here, we are impacting adult populations with both PQZ and Savanto Prime. So we're controlling white flies. If you look at silver leaf ratings, in most cases you see the same thing. You'll see some suppression with the Verimark treatments, uh, such as here, and then where you put the foliar applications on top, you tend to get a little better suppression. So we're controlling white flies with these products. We're controlling or at least reducing silver leaf symptoms. Long story short, if you look at virus, there are no differences. Uh, there are some minor differences occasionally once in a while, such as right down here, the, the third planting, you actually have a, a, it's not a significant reduction, but a reduction in virus. Unfortunately, that's where we didn't apply any insecticide. So the insecticides, bottom line, out of doing this three years and a variety of other studies, all the other studies I've ever done with white fly and looked at virus rating, I have never reduced virus with, in, with the use of insecticides alone. We manage white flies quite well. This is, this is the study this year. You can see the green plots, nice green plots where we're using insecticides. We manage white flies, we manage silver leaf but we can't, we don't have anything that, that kills them rapidly enough or stops them from feeding rapidly enough to really impact virus incidents with just the insecticide alone. Uh, Babesh will talk about some of the other things we've looked at and he's looked at, such as row covers and whatnot. There are ways we can impact virus transmission, but insecticides alone are not really doing it. Uh, Overall, with insecticides, uh, I don't think we've seen any changes in the efficacy as far as controlling white flies. We've done very good as far as resistance management. Growers have rotated products. We're maintaining the efficacy of the group fours and group 28s, which is critical. Uh, you got to keep in mind that most insecticides that we use are efficacious against nymphs. They're not efficacious in adults. We have a lot of people that use very good insecticides and are not happy with them at, when, when they first look at it because they've still got adults out there. Uh, most of them we use are, primar are primarily effective against nymphs. And again, we can manage white fly as a direct pest, but when we get virus into the system, uh, particularly in our system in Georgia, because we have very high populations, high virus titers late in the season, we do not impact that. 
Now there's some other situations. I know in Florida sometimes they show an impact of insecticides, but it's a different system. They've got lower populations more year round. We have overwhelming populations primarily in the fall. Over all the insecticides we use, this is from last year. I can use the same slide because it's the same information. If you're targeting adults, the best products we have are PQZ and Savanto Prime. Uh, Sale, Venom, x all give pretty good activity. It bounces a little bit. Sometimes it's great, sometimes it's good on adults. But if you're targeting adults, PQZ or Savanto Prime. Again, most of our products are efficacious on immatures and the products that are the top tier, the critical products in our system are the group 28 insecticides with the exception of Havanta. It's not that great on white flies, but Verimark, X-Rail, Corrigin are. And the group four or group four related, Svano Prime, Venom, Acel, Ectara. Not Admire Pro. For some reason, Admire Pro, it worked last year a little better than it has in the past three years, but it, but it doesn't work as well as the others, probably because of potential resistance issues. And then where you can, work in the growth regulators. Now my cotton guys don't like to see NAC on that slide. NAC is critical to cotton production because it's the cheapest product that they can use to control white flies and they're scared to death we're going to end up with the resistance. And if they spray half the cotton acreage with NAC and then we spray all the vegetable acreage with NAC, I think that's a very real possibility. So what they really would prefer you see is, is more use of courier. We use NAC in vegetables, not in, in, that's going to continue, but try to, try to rotate the, those others in like courier where you can. And then those third tier products all have good activity on nymphs. PQZ is again, great product on adults. I don't think it's great on nymphs, uh, but work those in because those are all different modes of action as well. And resistance management uh, is critical for this pest. Biorational products, uh, again, uh, uh, is Andre, does Andre show up today yet? Andre's going to talk a lot more about this, I think, I believe, but this is, we did some field trials with it. This is a greenhouse test where we looked at spear T. You'll see there on the MBI 306, a couple of other biologicals. This is about as good as you're going to get out of a biological, and then the XRL's on the end. This is leaf dips in the greenhouse and then it's kept in the greenhouse so it's high humidity over it's excellent coverage uh, and you get and we got decent activity out of the biologicals that way we in the field trials we just simply don't get that kind of activity uh, i did it with spear t i got good suppression two years ago with it last year uh very little uh, so the biologicals there's some available if, if that's what you have to use for Organic production, there's some that they have activity, but they can't compare with, with most of our conventional chemistries. All right, and then the big issue, one of the, in the area of research this last year, uh, Dr. Riley's been doing a fair amount of work on this. I've been doing some as well on just looking at uh, ways to do bioassays with white flies to monitor for potential resistance, maybe determine what will or will work, work in a specific situation. Uh, this is some of Dr. Riley's work with a, a postdoc, Paulo, and a, a graduate student, Jermaine, where they've been looking at this. Uh, the approach Dr. Riley's taken for, for looking, trying to, to look at a population to determine what is or isn't working or what may have resistance, they're looking, trying to look at adults. This is a much easier route than trying to look at nymphs. It's a lot quicker. They're going into a field. They can collect white flies with this yellow funnel system. Uh, you just take the funnel, tap it, and the white flies fall down through the funnel into the, into the vials to collect them. They take them back to the laboratory and then they, they can grow them, they expose them to cotton seedlings that they've grown and, and treated uh, either with a drench, you can actually do it with, with systemics as well. But then they're able to look at the mortality of the adults fairly rapidly. It's tw 24 hours reading, uh, so they can do a fairly rapid bioassay on the adults. Uh, and then they've, come in, they've gone in and try and make this short because of time, but they've gone in and looked at the, the, what the lab shows, survival of adults, and then what they're seeing in the field as well with adults, and you see that that correlates very well. So this, this adult bioassay uh, at least correlates well with adult populations. 
so it's a, a rapid way of monitoring. It's, we've done the same type of thing with diamondback moth. Uh, uh, hopefully this, I hope this works out very well for us because it's, it's very rapid. Uh, but one of the issues you run into is that most of our white fly insecticides are more, more efficacious on nymphs. Probably your best example, of course, or eggs. Best example here is pyroproxifen. So you may not get very good mortality of adults, but net pyroproxifen is working. So we're looking at correlating those bio, this adult bioassay with, with field efficacy to determine if, if, how well that links. Uh, that's one approach that, that we're taking, Dr. Riley's lab is taking. Another thing they're doing is, is monitoring resistance. This is something that Jermaine Perrier has been doing uh, in multiple populations. You see down here on the left, looking at uh, cyanotronilopril and imidacloprid and using this same, basically the same approach. Very interesting that, you, that we are seeing some situations where we've got reduced efficacy. Hopefully that we can use that to, to monitor populations. Again, this is a, about monitoring just to see where resistance might be developing. The, the kind of, uh, I'm not sure how, if this is good or bad or, or scary. The other thing Jermaine did is one of the things he looked at is, is what level caused mortality of the same population but reared on different crops. And you can see here that in this particular situation, he got much lower mortality on cowpeas, a little bit lower mortality on cotton than he did where they were reared on a, on a mixed crop or cucumbers. So actually the crop that white flies are developing on may very well be in influencing the efficacy of the products we're using from crop to crop. So this, this is something we need to pay a little more attention to, see if we can figure it out. It may tell us certain, in certain crops a product is not your, your product of choice. I don't think there's any shifts that would say it's not going to work at all, but possibly it's working a little less efficaciously. My approach on this, I'm hard-headed. I think, okay, these products are efficacious on nymphs. That's what we need to be looking at. Unfortunately, it takes a lot longer to do that on a bioassay where you're looking at nymphs. The approach I've taken, um, growing plants in the greenhouse, getting seedlings to a certain stage. Then I can take those and sit them out in the field for two days or cage white fly adults, collect white fly adults and cage them on the plants for two days. Let them overposit for two days. I have a population of known age. I can go in there and then at a certain stage, dip those plants, hold on to them, give it a week so that it's easy to tell if they're dead or not. If you've never tried to determine if white fly nymph is dead or not, at 24 hours, you're not going to be very successful. At a week, it's very easy to do. So that's why I wait a week to evaluate these. Uh, but that's the approach I've taken. Started working with this. First, we started looking at exposure very early in stars and late in stars, like first, second in stars versus third, fourth in stars. Sometimes there's not a lot of difference. Sometimes it's very dramatic. Some of these products, even products that we know are very good, like Venom, uh, later in stars, we weren't getting very good mortality. We decided, all right, we're working on a monitoring technique. We really need to look at the early in stars where they're probably working best anyway. Start out with one half rate, with a one X rate and a one half X rate. And that one X is mix up the product as if you're spraying it at 100 gallons per acre and dip it. That's about as good a coverage as you get and it's a really high rate to be honest. It's probably a two X rate to start with. One of the first things I saw is we weren't ever killing everything. So I thought, well, I would do a two X rate. I have never killed everything with this bioassay. I've never gotten 100% mortality even at two X rate with any of the products we look at. That tells me, it kind of scares me, is there is part of that population that's potentially highly resistant to everything we use. We can't kill it with probably a 4X rate with excellent coverage in the greenhouse. Can't get 100% control. So that tells you you need to be rotating products. You need you know, to, to maintain susceptibility in the population. We have, I think we have potential for resistance with everything we use. But bottom line, we're tr we, we did that. Then we also looked at some lower rates, a 1x, a 0.5, and a 0.1x rate. And this, you know, you'd love to see that kind of response, but unfortunately, you don't, get every, you don't ever get anything that clean 
in, in working with uh, biological organisms. But what we settled on for, for looking at and trying to monitor resistance uh, in the field in the future, we're looking at uh, a half rate, 100 gallons per acre, and a 0.1x rate. We did uh, six fields this summer, six different populations. You see some bouncing around in there. I'm not going to try and interpret what that means at this point until we get more data. Uh, see if we can get some consistent responses. But this is one of the approaches we're planning on, look, on, on looking at as far as trying to monitor resistance in the population or susceptible in the populations. We can do fairly easily do multiple locations. We can look at it over the season in a single location to see if we're bouncing resistance uh, by use within a field or if we've got widespread resistance. So that's, that's kind of the the research side of what we're looking at on insecticides. And I think I finished. Did I finish on time? But any questions? Be glad to address them. You're eight minutes early. Eight minutes early. I will address one question I've had recently on, on some biologicals. Again, we don't do I don't do a lot of work with biologicals, but like the the uh, vi the fungi, you can purchase there's a, a variety of them you can purchase and spray. Uh, Dr. Taves group's been working with, it's not a Syria anymore, I can't even remember what they changed the name to, uh, but it's the one that naturally occurs. Uh, I think it's helped us, it wasn't a lot of it two years ago, but it helped us a lot three years ago, it helped us a lot last year, I think, naturally occurring. Uh, most of those under the right conditions and the right environmental conditions can provide efficacy. And a lot of the data where they look really good, you'll find is greenhouse data. Because you can put it in there and you've got the right temperatures, you've got high humidity. If you get too hot, those things just, they don't last very long. Particularly in our environment, when our white fly populations are highest, we tend to be in very hot, dry conditions. And most of those fungal pathogens, uh, enomopathic fungi just, just simply don't the spores don't survive long enough to give you good efficacy in, in, in our environment. There's situations where they can, uh, but unfortunately that, that probably is not going to help us a lot when we have white fly problems in South Georgia. The, what you were showing with the differences in efficacy depending on the host crop, that was a bioassay in the lab or that was the application in the field you're talking about? That's bioassay in the lab. Correct, David, and and it's and it's not necessarily just rearing them on a, what crop they grew on. This is taking them off of out of a colony, and you feed them on that crop for what 24 hours, 48 hours, 48 hours, and you're getting different responses depending on what crop you're feeding them. So that so it's it's likely that it's triggering that that something the you know chemicals in the host are triggering a, a response. In the, uh, a, a resistance response in the insect. Is that documented anywhere else? You know if that's documented anywhere else, David? Well, when you move them, Doc, when you move them between crops, they'll crash population just by moving them between crops, too. Yeah, that's one thing. That, that's been known for years that white flies, when they, even in a colony, yeah. if you're rearing them on cotton and you switch them to cucumbers, they'll crash and then come flying back and then you switch them back to cotton, they'll crash and then come right back. But you, you lose populations just when they shift host as well because they've got to, they've got to adjust to the host or they do adjust to the host. It's a little complicated you know, because there's a lot of different mechanisms of resistance. Yeah. They got to detoxify some of that. So just the, the fact of you know a white fly population feeding on this this crop or a different crop may trigger different responses within the insect. And so when it triggers that response, it's going to already respond differently to the second crop being used to treat it. So that's where that short-term feeding is. Yeah. It's complicated. On, on the virus work on cucurbits. You, you had a general statement about all viruses. Did you look at population structure of those viruses? There's like six or seven across Gemini viruses, Cody viruses, Crini viruses. Yeah, this 
This was all done in squash. Sadiq's been doing all the sampling. It's mostly mixed infections, the same you already. Did you look at, you look at the virus structure in those, in those hosts or in the, in the crowd to see if it, because some of the, I would assume some of the podivirus is really quick transmission versus Gemini viruses. Did you there, see any change in that? There was very little podivirus in these in these studies. It's where we, we do, you can visually separate the podiviruses from the, the uh, cucurbit leaf crumpled in, the, in those, and that's what we were focusing on, is cucurbit leaf crumpled and that, that complex of viruses. And, and yeah, the, the data is, is, is primarily the, the crumpled in complex, it's not podiviruses. All these trials actually done in the fall, so we see more of them. That's what we All right, any more, uh, any more questions for Dr. Sparks? Uh, if not, we will, uh, Dr. Sparks, we thank you for your presentation and we will turn it over to our next speaker.